as we are in your presence, we thank you, Lord, that that is the most blessed thing there is, the yeah. greatest possibility, the most glorious wonder, most blessed communion and fellowship is with you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that you have invited us, drawn us, summoned us into not only fellowship, but the family of God. So we pray. We thank you, Father, as your children, that you guide and direct our lives for your glory. And we thank you, Lord, for the words that you've given to us in your holy scriptures. Yeah. They are truth. Lord, we pray, come, Holy Spirit, now. Open our eyes, give us wisdom, stir our hearts, let us see. And may it be true that seeing is believing, so that our lives can more and more live in the reality of who you are, who we are in relationship to you. We find Satan, yeah. many in every way, for hindering us, just uh, ask you to, as you form us, fill us, glorify Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So uh, today we're looking at Joseph. So if you guys want to study school, yeah, that's it right there. Okay, so uh, after the book, you know, basically this is more not because of the teaching, but it's more it's a story uh, from the life of Joseph. After the book of Genesis records the important events, the lives of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the primary focus, and again, the primary, not the only, but the primary focus becomes Joseph. There are many wonderful things to see from the account of Joseph. I think among them, foremost, of course, is the power and importance of forgiveness. Now, but the overall theme, I think, in many ways, of the, of the life of Joseph is the providence of God. What is the providence of God? Now, the English word providence comes from the words literally mean pro, ahead, beforehand. Video, we get a video that basically you see. So you see something beforehand. And so this is what the providence of God means. Now, this is an important definition. The providence of God is the biblical revelation. Okay, because you're not going to get this just simply by your own rational ideal of the world. You might be really become a dialect if that was the case. But uh, the providence of God is a biblical revelation concerning God's sustaining. Okay, this is critical. By the way, I don't know how many of you study physics, but, you know, the phys physicists, astrologers, basically it comes to a place where they think, like, really, we only know about 5% of the real world. Uh, you know, two thirds of it is what they call dark matter, which means in their materialistic worldview that is blind, deaf, and dumb to the spirit realm. This is all that we can discern. The whole realm there is the spirit realm of God and how the reality of this sustaining power. Just think of that as an atom ball. What holds an atom together? Power of God. And then also his overruling guidance, direction, and care for our lives according to his sovereign and holy justice. Mercy, wisdom, power, and eternal purpose. So this is critical because our lives are an aspect involved in, I'm going to use this word, embedded reality in the eternal purpose of God for us and for all things. Now the biblical doctrine of the promise of God is based on the foreknowledge of God, knowing and seeing everything that will happen as well as us and seeing us individually. The providence of God is more than God simply watching, more than God simply watching, since if he's uh, both this great cosmic observer sitting on the throne of the church, looking down, it's not what the Bible means. The providence of God is more than this. It's not God personally watching over us in every way and he is personally involved in acting in our law. Now, the promise of God is a biblical doctrine that Christians in the past centuries understood it best and lived by. 
How many of you know that the, the term that George Washington used most often for God? But in our second line, the curious culture is the best non spiritual. Many Christians are driven for practical ideas. If you don't profess deism, that people live as if God's just up there and the world runs on its natural laws. Every place, the invisible, all seeing, all knowing, and ever present personal hand of God in their lives with impersonal forces such as luck. There's no such thing as luck, by the way. So now our culture is moving toward polytheism. What I mean by that is, have you ever watched a golf tournament and heard some of you talk about the golf gods? <laughs> watching World Series. There's the gods of baseball. See how it's creeping in. They want to not just have luck as if it's impersonal, but now they want to contribute some kind of personal decision making. But it's important thing influences the event. Now, an understanding of an actual belief in the biblical revelation of the province of God is essential for us to be living in the real world as God sees. What is true? It's not just correspondence to reality. In fact, it's reality as God sees it. So when we correspond to that reality, we live in the real world. So we need to look at the biblical account of the life of Joseph to see the promise of God and seeing him who is invisible or a promise. Now, often people just say, this doesn't make sense. But life doesn't make sense. All right. Now, as usual, the beginning of the account of Joseph's life, you know, so many people, which is recorded in Genesis 37, verses 1 through 11, is vital to set the stage Thanks, David. It's vital to set the stage for our understanding of the events that will transpire. Now, there are four things in uh, these verses that are important to the story. First of all, his father Jacob loved Joseph more than his brothers, which is was a root of many problems for the family. It's always a problem. Second, Joseph is gifted. Administration and a supervisor over his older brothers. Third, as a result of his father's preferential and prejudicial treatment, Joseph's brothers were jealous and literally hated it. Perhaps because Joseph is such a biblical hero, many people don't really take into account that his brothers hated him. And why? You know, and this is we look at biblical characters as heroes, and you know, they eclipse the reality of the Bible. Of sin. You know, we're all sinners, the only ultimate hero is Jesus. As the story goes on, they hated him so much that while they contemplated murdering him, they decided it wouldn't profit them to get rid of him by selling him into slavery. Again, when we look at all the terrible and traumatic too. Uh, Four, uh, Joseph is given dreams from God about the future of his life, that he will be ruler of some kind over his father and his brothers, and Joseph goes and tells him about it. And this again complicates and compounds his brother's hatred of him. Now undoubtedly, and this is my, it doesn't say this in the Bible, but this is my understanding and interpretation. But the self esteem he received from his brothers, his father's uh, being his father's favorite, his God given talent of administration, that he would be placed over the family business, the supervisor of his older brothers. It's really difficult in a culture where hierarchy of age is critical. Remember the words of John the Baptist? You know, I came before him, he came after me, but he's ahead of me. All right, and it's amplified by his dreams. Joseph not only had a sense of confidence, the pride, and the arrogance that he was a man going somewhere. Now, the dreams Joseph was given are critical to the story because they made known God's sovereign purpose for his life and revealed that God was indeed taking him somewhere. But it's only when we read the culmination of the story. That we see the goal and purpose of God's plan. It's not until the point that at that point 
that we see how all the seemingly unrelated and unjust events he suffered were like pieces of the puzzle of his life that God put together. When we see the whole picture, we will no longer ask, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> Probably the best, best verse that summarizes this is Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. When after his brothers come to him and ask him to forgive them for selling him into slavery, Joseph declares, as for you, you've been evil against me. And God and it for good. Bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Now, these words are among the foremost in all the Bible to speak of the providence of God. For many misinform, many falsely conceive of the choices and acts of God on the one hand, the choices and acts of people on the other end is either or. That's the way most people conceive of it, either or. The Bible does not. As this, as this verse and many others explicitly state, both the sovereign acts and choices of God and the choices and acts of people work together at the same time. Now, the big theological word for this is concurrence, which just simply means it happens at the same time. All right, now with most mysteries of life in terms of physics or whatever, as well as theology, mystery of concurrence is not that. It happens. It's how it happens. Like the little girl I heard in a class, who was speaking about light, and the teacher says, "Does anybody know what light is?" She goes, "I, I, I. Oh, you know what light is? Well, tell us." She goes, "Oh, I forgot." <laughs> teacher says, "That's too bad because you're the only person that ever knew." Sacred <laughs> Joseph states that he came to see that through all the evil choices and acts, not only of his brothers, but others, it was the sovereign purpose of God to save lives. And we know that this sovereign purpose of God accomplished through Joseph to save his own family was to accomplish God's ultimate purpose. Through this family, Jesus would be born would become the savior of the world. Now, as well as so many other people in history, Joseph's life is a prophetic picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, since that was God's purpose for Joseph, what was God's plan to fulfill that purpose, to save many lives and ultimately bring Jesus over? Now, from our perspective, God's plan can be summed up this way. You can't get there from here. God's plan was to take this 17-year-old young man who was a Hebrew shepherd, which the scriptures says, uh, say were, was loathsome. I mean, to be a shepherd was loathsome. You know, the King James used the word abomination to the Egyptians. This guy who was living in the land of Canaan and bring him to Egypt to then raise him up to become second in authority under Pharaoh. The ruler of the most powerful nation in the world at that time, where he could then save the lives of his family, as well as millions during a devastating famine. And what a wonderful plan. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you like that? That's God's plan for your life. Wow. <laughs> like the use of God. That's great. All right. Yeah. <laughs> when we look at all the terrible and traumatic events that happened to get him there. We can say, see many things, pieces of the puzzle that take place in his life. And we might have asked all along the way, what's wrong with this picture? That's where God's taken him. What's wrong with this picture? Or it's like, again, as people say, when life doesn't make sense. Now, the first thing we say is that Joseph gets lost. As the story of Paul, there is a seemingly incidental state. The word of God tells us. And it is that Joseph, a confident, even arrogant young man with a call of God on his life for great things, a man who seems to know where he's going, gets lost. <laughs> on a certain day, his father sends him out to check up on his brothers who were taking care of the sheep. 
to see how the family business is going. The Bible tells us he got lost. What's wandering about? Genesis 37, 15. A man found him wandering in the fields, not just one the fields. The man asked him, what are you seeking? In other words, what are you looking for? You can imagine it just... <laughs> okay, here's so here's a young man for whom God has great things, a great future, a life with God is guiding for his glory, and he gets lost on his way, wandering <laughs> in the fields. Metaphor for what's life. wrong with this picture? <clears throat> Why is the statement even in the Bible? Have you ever felt sometimes that your life might be like this? Then in order to understand another thing, we need to take note of the refrain that runs through the story. And it is that the Bible says numerous times, the Lord was with Joseph being successful. For example, Genesis 39 verses two and three says, the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. He was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him. The Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. All right. This refrain of God being with Joseph, making him success, successful, stayed in the midst of terrible injustices and traumatic experiences. So first of all, Joseph finally finds his brothers. They seize him, throw him into a pit, initially planning on murdering him. Change their minds when they decide they can make some money with human trafficking and sell them to the Ishmaelite merchants who are on the way to Egypt. So, chapter 37, it says, Then Judah said to his brothers, basically, he says, Hey, what's wrong? Wait a minute. What profit is it if we kill our brother? And see, let us have his money motive. Kill his own brother. Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let us not, and let uh, not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our own flesh. And his brothers listened. The Midianite traders passed by. They drew Joseph up, lifted him out of the pit, sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and took Joseph to Egypt. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> Lord is with Joseph. Why did this terrible thing happen to him? Then after being taken to Egypt, he is sold to a man named Potiphar. And because God is with Joseph, he finds favor the sight of Potiphar. And Joseph rises to become his personal servant and overseer over Potiphar's whole household, his whole household business. He literally puts Joseph in charge of all that he owns. Because of this, God prospers Potiphar. It's not the quote unquote Adam Smith invisible hand that just had it's God's hand. God blesses all that Joseph does. Well, now, of course, that makes sense that God is with him, doesn't it? But then something else comes along and changes everything the temptation of sexual sin by the relentless seduction of Potiphar's wife. Day after day, she secretly approaches him, but he refuses her advances, not only choosing to honor his master, but most of all, not wanting to sin against God. That's one of the most critical statements about the life of Joseph, how we look at reality and his relationship to God and what controlled his life. And what was his reward from God for being faithful to God and a trustworthy servant to his master? Is that one day, after she grabbed Joseph and ran away, leaving his outer garment behind, she lies to her husband about Joseph seeking to rape her, showing him Joseph's garment as a supposed proof, and her husband throws Joseph into prison. Genesis 39 20. Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. He was there in prison. What's wrong with this picture? Lawrence with Joseph for making him successful. Why is he treated again with complete injustice, put into a place like this? Again, have you ever been faithful to God, doing his will, yet were rewarded 
with injustice. So Joseph is cast into prison. And once again, he finds favor with the most important person in the place. And the Lord prospers Joseph. And so we read in the final verse of Genesis 39, verse 23, the chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge, because the Lord was with him. Whatever he did, the Lord made the prosper. Everything and everyone in the prison is under the supervision of Joseph. And again, God blesses him so that he prospers. Well, again, once again, that makes sense, doesn't it? If God is with him. Okay. But then another major thing takes place in Joseph's life, which is that after suffering these traumatic events of injustice, he is forgotten. So the story of Paul's was told that one night two of Pharaoh's most important servants who defended him, his cupbearer and baker, were thrown into prison and each had a dream. The next day, Joseph, doing his rounds, notices that they're both depressed, asks them, what's wrong? They tell him that both of them had a dream. There was no one to interpret. See, that's the real world there. Should be an artist too. Joseph gives glory to God and says, Do not interpretations belong to God. Tell it to me. They then share the dreams with Joseph. God gives Joseph the ability to interpret them. Joseph says, It's good news for the cupbearer, because he will be restored in three days to his prominent position working with Pharaoh. But Bad news for the baker will be executed in three days. And it happens just as Joseph had interpreted the dreams. Now, because Joseph knew that the cupbearer was at was as close to a person to as anyone, the Pharaoh, and would be restored to his place of providence and power near Pharaoh. Joseph seeks to use the cupbearer's personal influence with Pharaoh and asks him to speak to Pharaoh on his behalf, get him out of the prison, or literally the place that he called his pit. So what happens? Genesis 40, verse 23 says, the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. I forgot. So what's wrong with this picture? Not only does the word of God tell us that Joseph is forgotten in that prison, it says he was forgotten for two whole years. God has a wonderful plan for his life, and if God is with him, why is this happening, or better, not happening? Think of all the potential that he had to do great things for God. And where's God in all of this? What's he doing? <laughs> Certainly the almighty God who has power over all things is able to do something. Have you ever felt this way? Even though you know God is able to change your life circumstance, nevertheless, in your heart, you feel like you have been forgotten by God. I'll just summarize ultimately life. You know, we're all along for the ride. No matter what we choose, what we do, ultimately we're all along for the ride. Then, suddenly, scripture tells us that after two whole years, Pharaoh had two dreams. However, none of the wise men and magicians, with all their occult powers, could interpret them. But then, remembering Joseph, the cupbearer recommends Joseph to Pharaoh. Pharaoh summons Joseph, who interprets Pharaoh's dreams telling Pharaoh that God had revealed what he, God, was going to bring to pass in the next 14 years. But there will be seven years of abundance, seven years of famine, and recommends a plan to administrate. Now, this is an important statement here. Seeing the outstanding spiritual gifts in the secularized world, we might just say, well, the guy had wisdom and intelligence and this or that. That's not the world you're living in. This guy, Pharaoh goes, this guy is gifted by the gods with spiritual gifts. So in seeing outstanding spiritual gifts of God and Joseph, 
Pharaoh swiftly makes his second in rule over all the kingdom of Egypt. Genesis tells us, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh. Without your consent, no one shall lift a hand or a foot in all the land of Egypt. So the question, what's wrong with this picture? It's not the picture. How we look at the picture. It's not the pieces of the puzzle. It's how all the pieces fit together. Or would you uh, see all the events, the large and small, that took place in Joseph's life? We can see the providence of God or Him who is invisible. First of all, when the scripture tells us Joseph is lost, that he might. We might ask, why is that even in the Bible? It turns out that it's God's perfect timing to get Joseph to where God wants to send him, which is to Egypt. So we read in Genesis again, that after throwing him into the pit, his brothers looked up and they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum and balm and her on their way carried down to Egypt. Was he lost? Not from God's perspective. But providentially had Joseph delayed for God's ordained timing to take him to God's ordained place where he would end up saving God's people. Second, constant refrain is that the Lord is with Joseph and he suffers a succession of injustices. What's wrong with this picture? Joseph's perspective, and of course ours, a whole lot, because it was injustice. The Bible doesn't deny that. It's like you said you did evil. Yet, from God's perspective, and God's promise, it was God's purpose for him to suffer injustice, so that when he becomes the second most powerful ruler in the world, literally having power and authority over millions of lives, you will know how painful and evil injustice is, so that he will rule justly when God's providence, he will be exalted to the place of rule, a rule that God had years before revealed in his dreams. And this is what the Bible says about Jesus. Although he was son of God, son, he suffered in order that he might be prepared to the place to be our high priest, to sympathize, understand exactly everything we go through. And not only that, undoubtedly, though, through all this, his character and his, and his heart was transformed from being an arrogant young man to being humble, <coughs> sensitive, submitted to God. <clears throat> and further, the occasions of tragedy and injustice were actually God's way of promotion. I don't think many people even thought about it. Think about all events that led ultimately to him becoming second in rule of the earth. First, he <coughs> started the family shepherding business. Then his brother sell him to slave to merchants going to Egypt where he is sold to Potiphar. It is then that, secondly, he receives a promotion. To be over Potiphar's whole house, business ventures. During this time, he learns about running the business of the whole plantation and all that is involved in agriculture and the economy of running a larger business, which will be vital during the future times of abundance and famine. <clears throat> this is the household of one of the most important people in Egypt. For Joseph is, quote, rubbing shoulders with important people in Egypt. Then, he suffers a false accusation of, of sexual harassment and is unjustly thrown into prison. It is here that third is promoted again. Be over the whole prison. During all this time, he learns how to run a whole government agency. And he is supervising and managing two of the most important kinds of people he will later work with. First of all, the officers. And what we, we would call today Pharaoh's cabinet. Just imagine how heavyweight those guys are. Powerful 
poor people in Egypt, like the cupbearer and the baker. Two, now let me just say that most people don't realize how important those people are in that culture. You know, we think of cupbearer and baker kind of like the guys in the kitchen. No, at least remember Neil Wachmaya, that's who what he was. He was a cupbearer for uh, Xerxes. These guys are the most powerful people in the cabinet of Pharaoh. Then two, he's working with unruly people. People have been put into prison. It is then, after waiting two whole years, in the pit of a prison, it is promoted to being the second most powerful ruler in Asia. And then again, think about him being forgotten for two whole years. We can only speculate. But most likely, after interpreting the cupbearer's dream, asking him to use his personal influence. You know, I think of it, I always put this word with networking. You know, in a network, you gotta get your connections, work your network, all that. He was working his network here, his personal influence. But Pharaoh, would, if, he, uh, if he had used his influence, Joseph would have been released from prison. And that would have been, would have happened. What, if, what do you think he mostly would have done? He would have gone to his father's house in Canaan. <laughs> where he would have been in a place where he could not be promoted to rule in Egypt. Never heard of again. And just think about it. He's released. There he is. He goes off. Nobody ever hears him. God kept him there till his perfect time to raise him up. And, by the way, another what's wrong with this picture. It also goes through the story. It's that after selling Joseph, his brothers tell their father Jacob that he's dead. For all the years Joseph is in Egypt, Jacob is living with great sorrow, believing his beloved son is dead. I don't know if you ever thought about it. Have you ever thought about why, during all this time, Joseph is actually alive? God doesn't let Jacob know. Joseph is a lot. You know, it's kind of like when I think about the book of Job. And you know, here's remember the council of Job is on earth, and the devil and God are talking, and God lets the devil go attack Job. And why didn't one of the angels up there go down to Job? Job, Job. God is God has chosen you to be one of the most important people in all of history. There's gonna be a cosmic war over you, over your life. Just go through all the suffering, and God will bless you. If he had been told about it, it wouldn't have been the same thing. He couldn't have been. Now, I thought about why God didn't let Job, Jacob know. And I, have, I believe that if Jacob had found out, knew Joseph was a, lot, was a slave of Potiphar's house, or worse, lying away in prison, he would have done everything in his power to set Joseph free and bring him home. It isn't that with parents, fathers, whatever, who care and love their children want to do. Don't you think God would have wanted to do that? The answer is no. For God had other things in mind. That after suffering for the time God ordained, being humble, transformed, and trained, God raised him up to a greater and more glorious place in a worldwide ministry to save millions of people. Most of all, God's very own chosen people. So the account of Joseph, the life of Joseph, is the story of God's provision. It's providence. As God's plan unfolds with all the terrible and traumatic events take place, we can ask, what's wrong with this picture? But when, when we see the end of the story, all the pieces fit together. They have a property. Many years ago, a poem was written that expresses this well. I asked God for strength that I might achieve, I was made weak, that I might learn, learn to humbly obey. I asked God for help that I might do greater things was given infirmity that I might do 
better things. I ask God for power that I might have the praise of men. Let's get the weakness that I might feel the need for God. I ask God for all things that I might enjoy life. Let's give him life that I might enjoy all things. <laughs> I got nothing I ask for, but everything I hope for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all most richly blessed. Even better are the words of scripture written by the apostle Paul. Oh, the depth, the riches, wisdom, knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. And how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of God? Who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him? He might be repaid. For from him, through him, to him are all things and be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thoughts and cross rocks. The village man and Reuben, not only would he say, let's not kill him, his plan was to come back and rescue him and restore him to his father. Right. And that also screwed everything up. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Plus, plus, by then, it would have been almost inevitable that the finger would have been pointed back at the brothers yep. who had conspired, and you would have had potentially complete dissolution of the family unit. There we go. That's yeah. another great insight. Exactly. It's always amazing to me about the cup here that he was to drink out of that cup, right? Mm -hmm. And if there was any poison in it, it would be food for me. It is. Yeah. And not be Yeah. So the, the she's saying, the cup bear, in many respects, the most trusted person by the king or pharaoh. Their life is in the cup bear's hand. But that guy's a bad guy. He puts poison in it. You know, he's dead. So you can imagine, again, the influence. That this guy had, why Joseph is asking him, remember me. And the other, you know, and God says, no way. <laughs> so, uh, you guys ever felt forgotten? <laughs> ever felt injustice in your life? Who has? <laughs> I mean, who has? When we're, uh, I think what all of it is, and this is what I, I want to emphasize, you know, we're along for the ride. You know, you weren't around, which is a self contradiction. It's not possible to choose who your parents would be, where you'd be born, what you'd look like, your heritage, anything. You know, we're blessed to be born and where we were. I think also we're amazingly blessed to be living in. Most of us were older at the time when we grew up. You know, yes. Uh, I just thought of something. Um, a long time ago, I was put on probation for a job I had, and then I went out and got the greatest job of my life. <laughs> so if that hadn't happened, then all right. the good things would have happened. But, it, but I didn't see it at the time. But but it's amazing. I'm sure a lot of people have similar experiences. Exactly. I, you know, years ago, because my mind come. Years ago, I mean, some of us were, there was a commercial on TV with Orson Welles. It's about wine. Yeah. If you remember, <laughs> yeah. 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 I, you know, in his words, we will sell no wine until it's time. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the way it is. I remember, Chris, you guys remember, I told this story where you had very close friends, Mississippi. And uh, uh, the man, you know, was a businessman in Columbia, really old state, 
architect of the state and many things. And so that was the way his mind went to work, you know, very faithfully. And so one day they find a chrysalis or a cocoon, mm -hmm. and he finds it and he brings it home because he's all excited for his children who are now growing up to be able to see the butterfly come out of the cocoon. And so they watch, and he goes to work the next day, nothing happens. They watch, nothing happens. You know, the next day, finally, the butterfly is coming out. It starts early in the morning. It's taking so long. He decides, oh, I gotta go to work. So he takes a knife, <coughs> cuts open the cocoon. The butterfly comes out, and its wings have not been mm. able to fully develop through the struggle mm. of mm. coming out. The butterfly ended up being handicapped. Mm. With the fly. Middle East. And you think about that when we're waiting. <laughs> you know, it's always also, again, your perspective. I don't know. Some of us play sports. I play football. Mm. Remember two a days. One, one year we had three a days. And you know, why do you go through all that misery? <laughs> oh, it's like a you know, you know, because you have a goal, you want to win. Well, that makes sense. But how about when you're going through all the things in life? You're there, Struggle. all the misery, all the pain, all the sufferings. But somebody is, you just say something? Okay, but somebody put it this way. Think of it this way. Uh, perhaps you've heard this, but you know, when you're conceived during your mother's womb, grow up, you have to go through the birth canal. I don't remember it, thankfully. <laughs> My understanding was not a very pleasant ordeal. All right. Well, this is an earth canal or a womb for eternity. Mm. And death is just birth canal. The birth pangs. The greater reality, fullness of life. You know, this world is shadow wave. It's all it is at best, black and white and gray. Mm. You know, we're going to the world of colors, ultimate life, living in the reality of what God has for us. And thank you, speed of God, for a long for the ride. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's what it is. And I think if there's anything in this story that I pray that will be what revelation, insight, not just here, but here. Mm -hmm. You will see and believe. Wherever you are, whatever timing it's at, whatever frustrations and difficulties in your life, even though those are real, ultimately your life is in God's hand. And He's taking you through this to not only make you a better person, but to take you to a better place so that really ultimately, as the Bible says, will reign Jesus Christ forever and ever. That's what God's doing in our lives. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add that there were messianic prophecies in the story of Joseph. Because he sold 20 pieces of silver and Christ was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Yeah. And when he's in prison in the pit, uh, one man is sent back to life after three days, another is executed after three days. Yeah. That's foreshadowing. Yeah. Amen. And you know, you think about it again. He said it the pit. You know, the pit in scripture, the Ultimate pit is Hades or Sheol. That's where the bottom. You ever heard anybody say, Well, come to the pit of hell? Mm. That's reality. They may not think it up here, but it's sort of, that's where Jesus, when we confess, he went to the throne of the dead. Mm. The Bible says that's where he descended before he was raised and now is seated at the right hand. God the Father Almighty, he will reign there. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Let's Amen. pray. Father, we give you praise and honor. And Lord, we thank you. Lord, I think of another wonderful illustration of the tapestry. We look at all the thread, chaos on one side, with the beautiful uh, picture on the other side. Lord, we're all just little threads, golden threads in so many ways. But mm -hmm. Beautiful threads that may not look like they make sense, sense in this world. We're part of the picture, part of the tapestry, as well as part of the reality, the body of Christ. Lord, so I pray, bless us. 
Guide us, direct us, fill us with faith so that in all that we do, we would see your hand, your hand, the hand of him who is guiding and directing us personally in all that takes place. So we thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, God bless you.